July 2009. I'm in Chicago, headed downtown on the train for my appointment at the Daily Center to at long last legally change my name from my old male name to a new female name. I'm an over-planner. I like lists and schedules and for everything to be just so. And in my over-planning, I leave a little extra time. I leave a lot of extra time. And so I slip into the hearing room at the Daily Center in downtown Chicago where my hearing is scheduled for 9 a.m., a little after 8.15. So I wait. I twiddle my thumbs. I check my email on my cell phone. I think about who I was, who I am, who I want to be. You see, once upon a time, I was a boy. At least the world saw me that way. I had a boy's name, boy's clothing. I had my hair in a buzz cut every summer for years. I wore suits and ties to important family occasions. I lived in the boys' section of the dorm at college, looking through old photo albums or pictures on my parents' walls. It was clear. Boy, boy, boy. I wanted a girl's name, girl's clothing, to wear skirts and dresses to important family occasions, to have my hair long and flowing, to live in the girl's section of the dorm at college, and I'm not sure how to reconcile those lists. Do I ask my parents to take down the pictures, to erase the person that I was, to cover the mirrors that reflect the parts of myself I don't want to see? the parts I don't want to remember. In that hearing room, I wonder why the clock on the wall isn't a simple clock hung, but individual letters screwed into the wall over the jury box with the hands protruding out. And I imagine going over in that empty room and changing the hands so that the hearing will start sooner. At long last, the judge comes in and calls my name. Yes, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. The judge is confirming that yes, I'm there to legally change my name, and no, I'm not doing so for fraudulent or deceptive purposes, and yes, I have all my paperwork together. And honestly, the hearing takes about that long, maybe two or three minutes, during which the judge directs more sirs at me than seems strictly necessary. <laughs> but I know to pick my battles. It's also a moment of fear and powerlessness, of not being able to push back against this authority figure who holds all of the cards in that situation. But he sends me down to the clerk's office, and at long last, two months and $526 after first filing my petition for name change, I am legally and duly recognized Rebecca Roden Kling. which won't do me a ton of good if I get pulled over with my old license, with my old name, and my old photo. So I go down to go across the street to the DMV, and while I'm on my way, I think about bowling. I had been out a few months prior with my friend Pete. Pete is a friend from high school, one of the many people in my life who's had to learn to call me Rebecca. And we're joking about bowling names. You know, those names that they put up on the screen that make fun of your given name and are somehow dirty or raunchy. And we're talking about what my new bowling name would be because my old bowling name was a play on my old male name. And I realize we're talking around my name. And I finally say, it's not Voldemort. You can say it and I will not burst into flames. You're allowed to laugh at that, the Voldemort joke. And I say that because Pete is the type of friend who will make a joke and then immediately retract it. Was that too much? Was that too far? And it isn't with him because he's laughing with me, not at me. Still, names can seem unimportant until someone refuses to call you what you ask to be called. Gender can seem unimportant until it's not. And those certified pieces of paper, as amazing as they are, 
won't help if I get pulled over. So I'm at the DMV, and they say that getting a new corrected license is actually pretty easy, $5 and a copy of that certified paperwork. But when I ask about changing the gender marker from an M to an F, I'm told I need a note from a doctor. I'm sent to the photographer who does a double take when looking at my old name and old photo, but before he can say anything, I say, yes, I know. That's why I'm here to get a new license. <laughs> So I take the photo, and it isn't great, but driver's photo, license photos usually aren't. And I'm feeling pretty good. It's maybe 10 a.m., an hour after my hearing, and I'm standing on the street in downtown Chicago with four certified pieces of paper saying, I am legally duly recognized Rebecca Rodenkling and a new driver's license to back it up. I even have time to get to work and run payroll, which I was supposed to be at work doing. But I really want that F on my license. In between filing that name change and getting it finalized, I'd gone out to a bar with some friends and once again had to present my old license with my old name and my old photo. And before the bouncer could even say anything, I said, yeah, I, I promise you, I'm just as unhappy about giving you that license as you are now having to deal with me having that license. <laughs> And he actually was fine. He wasn't an asshole or anything. He gave me a once-over and sent me in. But it reminded me how much it can hurt to not have documentation that matches who you are, how difficult it can be to move through the world. And something occurs to me. Summer of 2009, I've been getting mammed more and more. I've been getting surred less and less. I've been getting ladies went out with friends or using the women's dressing room at stores without a problem, and what if I go to a different DMV and tell a little white lie? <laughs> it's not just me being stubborn. Okay, well, it's a little bit me being stubborn. But it's also that difficulty of moving through the world, of getting pulled over and fearing a roadside referendum on my gender and just being able to hand the uh, officer my license. It's the difference of having that interaction with a bouncer or just walking into a bar. It's the difference of fearing that the TSA is going to catch me trying to smuggle a penis through airport security <laughs> and just catching my flight. So I think about that, and I weigh that against getting to work when I said I would, and I head to another DMV. And my number is called, and I go up to a little old lady at the counter, and I say, hi, I was just at the DMV downtown, and there was a mistake somehow, and it says M on my license, and that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and she looks at me, and she looks at my license, and she looks at me, and she says, well, let's get that taken care of. <laughs> The gods of bureaucracy are smiling on me. And I'm sure that some of that had to do with the privilege of the color of my skin and the way that I speak and being able to connect with that little old lady at the DMV, but in the moment, all I can do is stand there and nod. And she types away, humming and looking at her screen, and I am convinced that she can see right through me, that the screen is displaying my old name, displaying my old photo, displaying all of my lies and subterfuge, but I make it. And she hands me a sheet of paper saying, take that to the clerk. It was our mistake, so they won't charge you, but they'll need to sign off on it. And she sends me on my way. Oh, oh okay. And I make my way to the clerk and am sent for the second photo in a day but this time I am ready and smiling and subsequently handed the most perfect driver's license that ever there was. And in the moment, I am convinced that I have pulled the wool over this woman's eyes, that I have fooled the DMV, and that I have gotten away with something amazing. But since then, I've reconsidered. What if she knew everything? What if my old name, my old photo, my old license, and my old gender was on that screen for her to see, and she helped me out anyway? It is really easy 
to come up with a list of people who have not had my back, of bouncers and police officers and judges and people sitting in the Oval Office. But what if there's another list, a list that I don't get to see but still exists, of people who have had my back even when I didn't know it? That's sort of a nicer world to live in. But none of that occurred to me in 2009, and I walked out onto that sunny July day thinking about that license in my purse, and that's sort of how being trans can work. I have been required to justify my presence, my appearance, my very existence, and I try to pick my battles. I didn't have a discussion about queer gender theory with that judge at the Daily Center. <laughs> I have yet to have a discussion with a TSA agent about the problems of assuming a binary system of gender in the modern world. <laughs> but I am trans. I was a boy, at least, the world saw me that way, and I'm not anymore. And where's the fun in staying silent? Thank you. <laughs>